want to introduce to some of you and reintroduce to many of you my niece Megan Curry, who is here from the McAfee School of Theology in Atlanta, Georgia. I said it wrong the first service. God knows what I said, but that's the right school this time. Anyway, we are so grateful for her coming today to tell us about who Jesus has called the church to be. And I appreciate her passion and her love, and, and I thank you for embracing her as one of our own. And so, Megan, come give us Jesus, honey. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, the energy in here is good. Woo, okay. I need that the entire sermon, or I'm going to fade, and you're going to fade, and then we're all going to be sleeping. So, pray with me. God, we thank you that you meet us right where we are, and you meet us in this place. But God, I pray that these words move us past our stillness, past our fear, past anything that's holding us back, God. We are called to be uncomfortable. So God, move me out of the way and speak through me. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, my rock, and my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Dear church, I invite you today to dream of a church where all truly are welcome in a radical, inclusive way. I invite you to journey with me as we dream of the church God is continually calling us to be. Imagine a church where all are invited and where there is no exception. Imagine a church where you can come just as you are. This extends to those who may love differently than most. This ex extends to those who don't have the same sc color skin as you. This extends to those who may call the streets their home, not willingly. This extends to those who don't necessarily think the way we think. This extends to those suffering from illness, including mental illness. This extends to those who have been in a traumatic situation and cannot see past the pain. This extends to every single person who has been stigmatized by society, church, or someone they even love. Imagine a church where not only is everyone welcome, but everyone comes together to fight for justice. Imagine a place where people come together to stand up to every ism out there. Imagine a church where people say no to racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, classism, ageism, homophobia. If you don't know those words, Google them. You need to know them. Imagine a place that unapologetically stands up for the oppressed, even if they too have been oppressed. Church, you are different than most. Amen. You are made up of a people who exist in a world where others have pushed you down. Yeah. People have called you names. People have condemned you to hell. People have slammed doors in your faces. You've been ridiculed, judged, and killed because of who you are, who you love, or who you support. Right. I think we all know by now that Joy MCC was created for and by the LGBT plus community. This is a church where all are welcome, but that doesn't mean we don't still have work to do. Amen. If anyone knows what it's like to be treated unfairly, you do. If anyone knows what it's like to be shamed or treated horribly by your neighbors, you do. If anyone knows what it's like to watch as your community grieves the lives of people who were shot because of their sexuality, you do. Amen. You have experienced incredible pain. You've experienced loss and violence. You've experienced suffering at the bloody hands of the oppressor. Right. You have wept together, often leaving tears stained on your cheeks. But you have started healing together. Amen. Church, God is calling us to live out the words of Matthew 25. God calls us to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and visit the sick and in prison. In this text, we see the criteria of the final judgment as the author's most powerful ethical statement. These verses are addressing the nations, which most often refers to groups other than one's own. The foreign group is the object of the missionary activity between the death of Jesus and his return. In this passage, the author uses the analogy of sheep and goats. 
The sheep acted charitably, giving food, drink, and clothing to the needy. The goats showed none. Jesus makes clear which of the two we are called to be the sheep. In Jesus' parable, the king mentioned in Matthew 25 generally represents God, but here the king is the son of man. The criteria of whether a person is considered a sheep or a goat or whether a person has performed works of mercy to those in great need in the present world. In this passage, the righteous are those who innocently do good works. Surprisingly, both the sheep and the goats express the same disbelief in response to the king's address. Both the sheep and goats say, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry? While their questions are essentially identical, the questions carry radically different implications. The sheep evidently acted out of genuine compassion. They acted without any awareness that the king might be present among the least of these. They also acted without any thought of a possible reward. Jesus both proclaims the coming divine judgment and exhorts people to love the marginal as themselves. It is quite clear Jesus expects not just words, but deeds. Amen. What concerns this judgment is not the ethics of the faithful, but the judgment of the Gentiles, those who would either respond positively or negatively to the least of these that make up Christ's community. In Christ's kingdom, the blessed ones are those who do not retaliate with violence, but bear witness to a new empire by serving others. In Matthew 25, Christ has announced the arrival of God's kingdom while he cures the sick, welcomes the despised, and provides food for the hungry. He orders his disciple to carry out his ministry by doing likewise. The righteous ones perform these deeds with no idea that they were ministering to Jesus. Jesus says that whenever they gave food to the hungry, welcomed a stranger, clothed the naked, or visited the sick or imprisoned, they acted in kindness toward Jesus himself. Church, we have this hope. Jesus can identify with the least of these because he has walked in their shoes. This means that Jesus can identify with you because he has walked in your shoes. At some point in your life, you have likely been among the least of these, or perhaps you find yourself there now. In your moments of pain, in moments when you have been impacted by the lack of help from others, or perhaps the hatred or bullet of others, Jesus feels your pain. The blessed ones are those who have seen a king who is not like the kings of this world. They are blessed because they know of a God who brings real peace who sees the needy and who hears the cries of the oppressed. In God's family, no one is hungry, naked, sick, or alone. We too are blessed because we know of a king and a savior who brings real peace and who sees those of us in need. We have a God who has heard our cry and saints. This is good news. In Matthew 25, the words of Jesus teach us what it means to be Christ-like and what it means to be hospitable. Hospitality is a huge reason why faith communities and churches like you are so incredibly vital. Pope Francis paints a picture of the church as a mother with an open heart whose doors are open. This is the church God is calling us to be. Amen. Through our care for those who hunger, thirst, are sick, or in prison, we are much like a mother with an open heart. Our doors are open wide. Every time you enter into your mama's house, her door is likely always open. Her heart is ready to put food in your stomach and clothes on your back. Jesus is calling us to be like a mother with an open heart and open doors. Pope Francis also says the church is called to be the house of the parent with doors always open, where this is a place for everyone with all their problems too. Our parent is ready to welcome each one of us with open arms. Amen. These arms are open wide even when our own families and parents' arms may not be. Right. Matthew 25 paints this image of caring for the least of these. I'd like you to imagine that we as a church are called to be much like Christ with open arms, open hearts, open minds, and open doors. Amen. God is ready to welcome all including one's own problems, just as we, the church, are called to radical welcome. The church, more specifically this church, is the household of God, 
The body of Christ is the institution par excellence that exemplifies and lives out hospitality. This is something we have been called to live out. Church, we are called to be a community that is sustained by a way of life that acknowledges that our lives are inherently relational. Our lives are enhanced by our life together. We all need a community that welcomes lost and lonely people. We ourselves have likely been there. Have you? This church is called to be a family, offering one another a place at the table and a sense of belonging. The expansiveness of the invitation reminds us of the theme of the great banquet, where all are invited, where all may come in, and where we may be surprised at just who is feasting at God's table. I invite you today to remember these things so that you might take action. God is calling you to help the oppressed because you yourself know what it feels like to be oppressed. One of my favorite authors, Rachel Held Evans, once said, what I love about the ministry of Jesus is that he identified the poor as blessed and the rich as needy, and then he went and ministered to them both. I think this is the difference between justice and charity. Charity means moving beyond, or justice means moving beyond the dichotomy between those who need and those who supply and confronting the frightening and beautiful reality that we all desperately need each other. Church, we all desperately need each other. Yes. We have all in some way been oppressed, whether it is because of who you love, how you identify, the color of your skin, how much money you make. Yes. You have likely felt the sting of oppression. It is because of this that God is specifically calling us to help one another. It is because we know how it feels to be overlooked and burden that God calls us to help our neighbors. Amen. God is calling you to be hospitable because you know how it feels when others are not. Right. Being hospitable to others requires that we are fully present to the needs of one another. Yeah. Hospitality that practices presence and attentiveness may lead us into deep waters. Hospitality as faithful presence might well involve challenge or resistance, perhaps even conflict. This kind of presence might lead us to the margins, to the outsiders, to the little ones, to the poor. These are those in whom God had a special interest and those with whom Jesus has spent so much time. Jesus came to his own people who were mostly poor and unlearned. So it is amazingly good news that God had more in common with the uncomplicated, the humble, the generous, than with the proud and self-satisfied. This is where the Son of God feels truly at home. Yes. I was a part of an intentional community in Asheville, North Carolina, the gay capital of the South, they say, for about a year called Beloved House. Beloved is a community primarily of individuals who are experiencing homelessness and injustice. Many individuals who are a part of the community are forced to live on the streets. The owners of this nonprofit, Amy and Adrian, seek to welcome all people, those who are without shelter, those who are without families, and those who are poor. They welcome those who are brown, black, white, gay, straight, transgender, you name it, they will welcome you. Amen. There are simply no limits to their hospitality. Amy and Adrian have taught me through their love for others what it means to be hospitable. Amen. They believe in the power of community. They believe wholeheartedly that everyone needs a village. They have created a community of mutuality that is lifting up their neighborhood and building new economies based in love and justice. Yeah. Their, mis their mission is to live on the margins and to try to change the world through community. Yeah. They seek to end homelessness, poverty, prejudice, and injustice. Yeah. Church, I believe that Amy and Adrian understand fully what Jesus was saying in Matthew 25. Jesus is calling us to serve, to help, and to love. Yeah. Jesus is calling us to serve those who we may not, serve, may not have served before. The ministry of Beloved House is doing the work that Jesus calls us to in Matthew 25. In what ways can we be like Beloved? How might we be hospitable because we know how it feels when others are not? Amen. Lastly, God is calling you to see the face of Jesus in those you meet. God calls us to this because God, because people have failed to see the face of Jesus when looking at us, Amen. and we know what that feels like. Amen. There's a story of a teenage boy named Alex. He struggled with anger issues. 
Alex wearing a dark green shirt with ripped raggedy jeans and his brown hair sweaty and slicked back. He got so upset at another child in his youth group that he grabbed her by the shoulders and tightened his grip. Alex, with his face bright red and flushed, was unwilling to give up control. His youth minister stepped in, looking at him and said, let go of her. Alex still wouldn't let go. The youth minister repeated herself, hoping that he would let go before she had to step in, and he responded, why should I let go of her? The youth minister replied, because I'm going to look you in the face until I see the face of Jesus, because Jesus is in you. Alex immediately let go of his peer, dropped his arms, and started to cry. No one had ever said he had any Christ-like qualities, and no one had seen Jesus in his face. Yet his youth minister showed him mercy and grace and was able to see Jesus in the midst of all he was doing wrong. Isn't it amazing what happens when we reach the realization that Christ is in all of us, even the stranger? Christ is in each and every person, even those we least expect. Christ is even in us. Church, God is calling us to love by seeing the face of Jesus in our neighbor. God is calling us to show mercy and grace to our brothers and sisters. God is calling us to help the oppressed and to be hospitable because we know what it feels like when the opposite takes place. Lastly, God is calling us to recognize Jesus in our neighbors. In doing these things, we are loving the way that Jesus has loved us. We love because he first loved us. We love also because we know how it feels when others fail to love us. Church, God is calling us to act in tangible ways to show love. Jesus calls us to do the work of Matthew 25. So I invite you today to think of the way, the ways, hopefully there's more than one way, that God is calling you today. Can you take a meal to your neighbor who's sick? What if God is calling you to fill up the gas tank of a loved one who you know is struggling? Perhaps God is calling you to welcome someone you don't necessarily get along with into your home. Can you show up and visit your friend who's in the hospital, even if hospitals make you uncomfortable? Perhaps God is calling you to visit a family member who finds himself in prison. Can you look the person who's experiencing homelessness in the eye and acknowledge their existence? Is God calling you to sign up for the event taking place at Joy on March 23rd where we offer food and canned goods to our community? Is God pushing you to be a volunteer that day? Maybe God is calling you to stand up for those who are bullied in your workplace or in your school. Amen. Perhaps God is calling you to use your voice to advocate for common sense gun laws yes. and to write letters to the governor yes. because you yourselves have seen firsthand what a military style weapon can do to a community. Amen. What does Matthew 25 look like for you? What will you do? What will you say? What will you write? Where will you go? Who will you meet? How will you take action? Church, we have called to be to help the oppressed because we ourselves know what that feels like. We've called, we've been called to be hospitable. We've been called to see the face of Jesus and even the stranger. We have been called collectively to show the love of Jesus. God dreams of a church that feeds those who are hungry and gives water to those who thirst. God dreams of a church that visits those who are sick and in prison. God dreams of a church that leads the way in fighting against racism, sexism, yeah. homophobia, and transphobia. God dreams of a world where children can go home safely from yeah. school. God dreams of nightclubs where we dance all night long. God dreams of a church in a world where all are welcome, where justice wins, where love heals, and where strangers are given a place at the table. May it be so. Amen. Yeah.